Mitten hard with the headband, huh? Yeah, I'm going all in on the. Is it like uh, a holding spot for the mask? Like you just pull it down when you're. <laughs> Instead of wearing it down here. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should be drinking a tab instead of a Coke too. Yep. Although you hit the product placement pretty well. I like held it up for the camera real nice. I'm good at being a mouthpiece. Okay, be this, this meeting sponsored by Coke. <laughs> As a reminder, please sign in on the agenda sheet if you haven't already. All right, we're five minutes after. Should we kick things off? Let's do it. Uh, first thing on the list is sign into the document. I think still missing some signatures there, just as a reminder. Um, let me know if you don't have access or anything. Uh, 
next thing on the list is new faces. Do we have any new faces here today? I don't think so. Uh, don't see anybody at least. Um, then release planning updates. Cool, I could uh, give my update from PAC side. We're working on trying to get to feature complete a little bit behind schedule on that, but uh, we have, I think two outstanding PRs that would enable platform API 04 to be supported and uh, working on that hopefully by end of day today, we'll get that in. Awesome, any questions? Ben is trying to talk, but he's muted. Ah. Yep, so many mute buttons. Uh, I'll speak to the lifecycle side. Um, lifecycle 09 went out on Friday. Thank you, Natalie and Yael, uh, for working with um, Emily to get that done. Uh, it's got a bunch of new stuff, including support for pack, build pack 04 spec and platform 04 spec. And uh, there are great new features that I can't wait for Javier to finish up pack so we can test and use. Maybe it's worth also calling out that we might be shipping a patch to that life cycle. Um, basically, Javier, through his work, uncovered that when there are multiple processes defined, um, we need a way to default to web, I guess, for pack users who are used to having that feed the workflow. So we have a PR up to the life cycle that would enable that. Uh, so the, there was an explicit decision made that the life cycle would not have a default and the default would only be specified by the platform during the build process itself and then be encoded into the image that was created. I, Correct. yeah. <laughs> Uh, we mm -hmm. could talk about that at length here. Uh, we could add it to the agenda and make sure that we're all on the same page. I'll add that in. Any other release planning tasks or should we move on to PR reviews? Sounds like we're moving on. Give me one second to share my screen. All right, everybody see that? Give that a refresh real quick. Sounds good. Hold on. I was actually about to open, open one thing too. There you go. Talk. Okay, good. So uh, first thing in the list, RFC author creates repo issues. Anything that needs to happen here is, needs approvals, it looks like. Yeah, uh, yep, just some approvals there. Uh, the it is a good opportunity to point out that over the last two days, like five different uh, RFCs closed FCP and were merged. Uh, and even if this hasn't been officially done yet, if those were your RFCs, I highly recommend you open issues against the spec for them or against the proper places. I got them through just in time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll do first of those. Um, next thing on the list, uh, deprecate service bindings. This is mine. Uh, I think we're just waiting for Stephen just did it. So that can go to FCP now. Uh, Emily is out this week, so we're not going to get her vote on it, but I'll put it through FCP starting today. I did this a long time ago. Then Much somebody time. just voted for it today. Terrence looks like Terrence. Yeah, Thank me. you, Terrence. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm still catching up on stuff from last no week. Uh, this just needs to vote for Emily, I think. Uh, Emily is no, oh Emily's not going to vote for it because well I guess she will sometime next Monday the day before it yeah, yeah, she's on vacation, anyway. that's right I don't, yeah. I don't it's not needed to move into FCP yeah um, yep. but she's I think she'll be back before it closes is that correct one day one day 
a day i assume that will be filled with nothing but yeah uh, or i mean i'm, I'm happy nothing holding but it up. yeah holding it uh i don't know if we're in a, if ben's in a rush yeah. to get that one through if we nope. want Emily but to i'll just i'll move it to it she'll get through it'll be fine okay yeah, yeah. I just have the resiliency now that when one person's out, we don't have to hold everything up. <laughs> yeah. Um, Exec D, shell free profile D. Uh, this is mine, and I'm just waiting on. Oh my gosh, I was waiting on approvals, but now I think this is ready to go to FCP. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, uh, uh, yep. And then very excited about what we can do with this in the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, FCP. I'm doing it now. I got it. Thank oh, you so yeah. much. Okay, and then I'll move on to any stack build packs. Um, is this in the same situation? Here we go, we got. Yeah, I just beautiful. had a, I voted for it because it wasn't blocking, but I was wondering if it was before you merge this in, if you could just, just from the discussion last week, we talked about the distro stack thing being a separate RC. I just wanted to put that note in. And also Ben's uh, typo correction, probably worth uh, pulling that into. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yep. Alls. Oh gosh. Okay. Good. Um, um, yeah, I thought there was a good discussion around the was distro. This? No, the the distro specific, like like an Ubuntu stack thing that we wanted to potentially have as a separate RFC. Just making a note under unresolved. I don't know if I remember. This is like, could you say that your build pack runs on anything that's Ubuntu based, for instance? Yeah. Um, that we were going to try to not to add it as functionality to the yeah, issue, exactly. just that we discussed it and it might come up again in another RFC. Yeah, cool. sounds good. We'll do. Um, but this this can move forward to FCP in seven days. Not not yeah. blocked on that. Hit yeah, refresh yeah. and it's there. Cool. <laughs> awesome. RFC for project descriptor flexibility. Yeah, I guess I'm uh, not sorry. sure how to move this forward at all. So. Let's put it on the topics today. Yeah, let's just put it on topics. Sounds good. I think I don't have strong opinions about this. We should try to get through. I agree. Uh, layer or origin metadata draft. So moving on. Uh, pack subcommands. Uh, this one came up as something that someone wanted to call a vote on it or something. I did, but I think that was before I realized that Joe had put something in there. I think that might be resolved now. I don't know, Joe, if you want to continue to talk about it. Yeah, I liked the proposal you had. I definitely thought it was better. Um, so if you're good with that, and if that's up there, I'll cool. vote on it this afternoon or something. Yeah, I'll update it when I get a chance, then call you up. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Experimental features. Yeah, I, d I don't really have a desire to drive consensus on this. So if there's something that, if this needs work, um, yeah, I, I feel kind of like, let's either do it or not. Um, I did update some things for Emily, but then she didn't vote. So I don't know where she stands on it now. Cool. Uh, any action to take? I'll uh, comment on it and ask Emily to weigh in on the recent changes. Cool. I mean, we can also just like vote on it, and if it's a no, that's fine. Like, <laughs> maybe we don't do it. Uh, Javier also has blocking changes. Looks like from the top right. I think I resolved that one. Yeah, I don't remember exactly where this was at. Overall, it was good. I think they were just minor things. Okay. I've called you to re-review as well, Javier. Cool. We do a plugin system. I'm very interested in how we want to architect the plugin system because we have, we did this in the CFCLI very, very poorly, I think, initially. It's, yeah, uh, plugins are hard to do well, but add a lot of sensibility. Yeah. Um, this is not proposing plugins, FYI, too. Right, it's an alternative, so. Oh, it's an alternative. You're straying away from plugins for now. Got it. Okay. Cool. Um, and then the re remaining, no, sorry. Then uh, experimental features. We just talked about application mixins is on the list, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, not go to Google, but skip it. Uh, offline build packages RFC. Do we have Dan here? Here. Uh, 
I think that there were some small changes that needed to be made to this after some conversations with you, Stephen, and some of the stuff we talked about last time. I think this is going to go in kind of a different direction. So I'm working on rewriting this to kind of have a different sort of structure. Not really offline build packages anymore, but kind of solving the same problem. Awesome. So um, just leave it where it is. Yeah. Should it go to draft? Um, yeah, probably. Um, and just take it out of like, Sorry, I, Yeah, you can't. They didn't seem like, maybe I misunderstood the outstanding changes, but like, uh, if you've seen any of my RFCs, they go through a lot of iterations without going back to draft. So I don't feel like that's absolutely necessary. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary now, but if it's going to be a while and we should ignore it at the next meeting, sure, sure. that's a good reason. Yeah. One of the changes is, is shifting the offline packages out of the, the build package image. It, it, like there's a, there's a pretty, I don't know, like it, I expect there to be quite a bit more iteration on it before we get to something that, that feels right. Um, so. Assets, Steven. Like that Assets, Assets out of Assets. the package. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> Cool. Anything else? I think that's it for our C review. Uh, so next thing on the list is cube uh, You requested this, uh, Terrence. Oh, uh, I think Joe actually was the one that told us to put it on here because he. Didn't yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Sorry. You know, I, I haven't been following super closely. I just want to make sure everybody that uh, will be helping out is on the same page and. You know, if anybody, just give everybody a chance to ask questions if need be. Um, I know I volunteered to pick up Slack if it's necessary. So I, I'd like to know if I need to do that, that kind of thing. Also, for those of us who haven't been paying super close attention, can somebody involved tell us what this ended up being? Like, how is this going to work? So this is, this is a, um, it's like a, it's supposed to simulate, you know, people going to booths in a large conference center, um, but without any any kind of video chat or anything like that. It's it's like a chat room that you sit in uh, for, you know, some period of the day and people come in and ask questions. And then there's like a, a virtual booth website that's all decorated nicely, you know, with like CMB stuff everywhere, you know, and people at the conf virtual conference come in and like hey I like what's this project about tell me about this or does it solve these problems and then um, people associated with the project are marked as moderators or something like that and can answer questions and do things like that uh, we have a sign-up sheet and everything we're trying to fill out times I know I haven't filled that out yet but a whole bunch of people have um, we started with five people but then realized that we can have more people staffing the booth as long as um, yeah. yeah thanks uh, as long as the um, they don't need free KubeCon passes. That was the limit of five people, I think. <laughs> and so uh, I think we have 10 people kind of signed up to staff at different times now. Um, I, I don't know if we can add more. I think it's locked at this point. You have to have registered for KubeCon. Um, but we have a good good mix of people from uh, you know different companies and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it'll go pretty well. Certainly no one in EU. All those times are still blank slots to sign up for the really, really early times. Yeah, I was going to say there's still a lot of open times so i do feel like maybe we we might need more assistance or more dedication it's it's a unless like steven you're just stepping in for everything that's blank for, at least for the except for the really early stuff i'll, I'll just be in the chat all day probably <laughs> yeah I, I can help out with some of the early stuff i mean it's probably not the end of the world if we just don't show up at 6 30 maybe it, it, the the times they recommended no nobody said you have to have somebody there for every single you have to have complete coverage to yeah. make sure that there's somebody to answer questions all the time they were just there for for the four days they said here are the recommended times we'd say you should have somebody around your booth if you know to simulate the what it looks like at a real conference yeah we could also throw up a message at six thirty that says like we'll be back in an hour <laughs> you know that kind of thing sounds good it's probably um, a good idea it, it's a long time for them to expect people to staff things. Although yeah. I guess that's what they have five. Yeah, I was going to say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually make that argument to Joe and Terrence who regularly staff physical booths for that many hours a day at conferences. <laughs> Somehow this feels more exhausting. <laughs> yeah, Zoom, Zoom calls feel worse, I guess. 
or not a zoom call it's not a zoom call it's just chat there's no no video chat at all yeah um it is all also all volunteer so i don't know if there's like a ton of expectation of forcing yeah. us to do everything too when we set up yeah. the booth we should also add the slack to the uh to the side panel or something if we can like a link to our slack if they have you know if they want to reach out that way too yeah definitely I think the uh, in the mock-ups of the virtual booth, the Slack URL is the very top of the booth. Cool. Any more questions about the booth? All right. Let's move on to application mix-ins. Yeah. So I think we might be ready to uh, call for votes. I'll just go over the, the changes that I made since the last discussion we had. If I can find the file. Um, I did some things. I made changes to the directories. I think that's new. Um, yeah, I updated the keys. I changed the ignore list. Um, I added, let's be easier to look at here. Uh, I added a stack toml that is sort of an analog to launch toml with build restores for paths that will always be restored even if the base image changes and run excludes for uh, directories that will be excluded from the final launch image, even if they exist as part of the, as part of the snapshot. Uh, so that sits alongside launch toml and a build pack writes one or the other. Um, I've noted that there will be uh, platform API changes or platform specification changes, but I, it's just really not possible to like catalog those at this time. It's going to depend on the implementation. So I, if need be, I'll open another RFC for those. You know, just like different flags to build and stuff like that to builder. Not 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 to build to builder might have different flags. Um, I think that's the main stuff. So take a look. I guess let me know if there's something that needs more work. But otherwise, I think we might be ready for a vote. I thought of something over the weekend that I realized I'm not sure if we addressed. Um, the way mixins work right now with stage specifiers is kind of weird. <laughs> it's like, um, it, you know, if a if a run image, and I'm, I'm going to open an RFC oh, about this, this is... eventually, but if if a run image says run colon mixin name and a build image says build colon same mixin name, mm -hmm. you know, it implies that you don't need that mixin to be on either image in order to use the images with each other. Right, um, so like you know, you could take the run colon mix in name off the run one, and it would still work with the, the build image, right? So it has a meaning, um, but that's going to be really weird <laughs> with how mixins work. Do we send the pre prefix mix in names to the run one and the? Yeah, I I did not put this in here, but that that's what we I think we actually talked about this last Thursday. But like for mixins, build and run, you'll end up with a different set going into your then build from the uh, the list of required mixins, and then for something like the CA build pack where it doesn't operate using mixins, um, I think we talked about introducing an environment variable that it can switch on. Uh, like I install these certs at build and these certs at run, right? So it, that's how it would do that. My hope is that there won't like a lot of it will just fall out from how the life cycle handles things like stack toml so like both times it runs it'll write this exact same thing and then at build it'll just read this and for run it'll read this does that make sense yes there are some edge cases that i'm worried about like if a build pack uh, you know, dynamically requires um, run colon uh, image magic. 
and the stack image provides uh, image magic on the run of the build image that's not going to get matched by the stack image and would get sent to the app build pack to install, even though image magic is already installed. Oh, I see. Why, why would it not match? Because run, because... run, run colon package name is a completely different mix in from, <laughs> uh, you know, not run colon same package name. That almost sounds like a problem that exists outside of stack build packs. But we should like we should figure out what how to deal with it, <laughs> if that makes sense. I mean, I guess oh yeah, okay. Oh, okay, I see, because the problem is that the problem is not that it can't install it. The problem is that it won't match the pattern uh, defined here, right? Uh, uh, in the, so it, it won't be like statically matched because image magic is not equal to run colon image magic. Um, so th that thing, if that's thing set to any true, right? You don't have a list of mixins there, but in the, in the actual, in the yeah. non, non stack pack mix in list where it says, um, yes. uh, requires, you know, uh, run colon image magic if the base image just has image magic on it and a build in a run image, right? It right. doesn't have those stage specific things, then it's not gonna, it's, it's gonna pass it to the stack pack anyways and attempt to install it. So it's, it's actually, it's not the field you have highlighted there. Well, it's the interaction between them, right? Well, the, I mean, yeah, if it's not the field I have highlighted here, I don't see why that problem like just take take stack build packs out of the picture. You just it just doesn't work, right? Uh, well, I mean, in, in this case, it's that you can put mix in names in the build plan, right? Which is the thing that's getting introduced by stack packs. This isn't about the build non stack pack build packs build pack toml. It's about you, when the build packs use the build plan to put. You know, to specify mixin that they get passed to a stack pack. There's there's a whole bunch of weird edge cases with m matching the mixin name to the list of mixins in the base image. I think I'm, I'm going to open an RFC about this, but I'm I'm worried that there's extra stuff we need to specify. Even if we change, we need to kind of change the way mixins work so that requiring image magic is you know satisfied in all of those cases. Yeah. Like subtly change the definition of a mixin so they're they're run colon image magic and image magic are more related to each other. They, the, they're not as right, strictly right, separate, right? right? Um, and, and once we do that, we might be okay, but I, I, I'm worried that there are some weird edge cases, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it would be really helpful if, like, if you could just like spell out this particular example in like a high level, not high level of detail, but like a little bit of detail. I think that would help me a lot. Makes sense. I, I'm gonna open an RFC about changing the Wave mixins or like relaxing the restriction on mixins generally, and I think that will help. But then, then after I open that, I'll come back around to this and then say, you know, um, but I, I don't think we need a block on it, or I'm, I'm happy with just an unresolved question about it as long as we're willing to maybe make some changes to how the matching happens in the future. Okay, cool. I think we're we've turned mixins into something that's a little bit different than they were originally, but that's okay. <laughs> And then the other comment I had was the names equals field, um, where everywhere else it's mixins equals. Um, I, I still want to suggest a different structure there. Okay, yeah, I'm not married to any of that. Um, we could do build pack dot requires, although I hesitated to overload requires or provides, um, and then just have any equals or mixins equals instead of names equals or something like that. Not strongly opinionated either. I can take a pass after this and suggest some things. Cool. Cool. Anything else in application makes sense? All right, next thing on the list is uh, 
checksums on releases? Um, I put this up. Um, I, uh, this had come up in like a team discussion. Um, I remember when I was in build packs, um, so then we were very intent on, uh, on having checksums, um, a checksum file with all of our releases. Um, and I found it interesting when I initially joined that we don't do that um, for, um, for the releases that we published either with, uh, with Lifecycle or with, uh, or with PAC. Um, I wondered whether there was any kind of uh, precedent for why we weren't um, or if, uh, if we would be interested in doing that. I'm um, interested in us doing it. I'd go a step further and say we should be signing them instead of just putting a check sample on them. Sure. Seems like a lot of pushback. Okay. Um, I assume that would be an RFC for project wide. No. Just go do it. Teams that are responsible for these things, go do them. No need to ask permission for this. If we wanted to say say that every part of the project, when we release things, must have signatures in the future, an RFC wouldn't be wouldn't be a bad idea. But you know, it feels like this is just. Good, good release practice. <laughs> we should do it because it's, you know, yeah. Uh, software. Coordinate with Stephen for the generation and creation of sign-in keys. Does anybody uh, which will stuff into LastPass and then eventually into GitHub? Does anybody have preferences on signing technology? It's a very controversial thing in some spaces right now. A lot of people think you keep using PGP for everything. A lot of people think mini sign or you know modern cryptography is better for it? Uh, I mean, there are better options, yes. No, I haven't seen them used enough nah, to put a stake in the ground. Like signing it with a utility that nobody has or yeah. there isn't a ton of stack overflow on how to use to validate, might as well not be signed. Do both of them if you really care, but I think we have to do PGP for uh, compatibility. This is why decisions matter, people, because you are stuck with them forever. <laughs> you, you're just continuing the trend. <laughs> just, just checking. Some people are very, very allergic to PGP nowadays. Oh um, yeah, I mean it's horrible, but it's what we've got. A, a mini sign, you know, a lot, a lot of people. I see some projects. Which that, which that. utility currently installed on my computer? And trust me, I install a lot of shit. Will validate a mini sign signature. I think mini sign can use SSH keys, and then it's like you got it already. It's common format. I forget though. That might be. Are right. Are you so, advocating mini sign right now, Stephen? No, I just wanted to. We're talking about release process and signing things. Wanted to bring up. Bring it up before we make a decision on it. Uh, we probably, we David, least... just in case it wasn't clear, we should also be doing hashes as well. SHA-256, I think, where the industry has moved to these days. <clears throat> Anything with an MD5? Mm, I don't think so. All right. Uh... Anything else on that? If not, next thing on the list is lifecycle's default process type. The most fun thing ever. Let's talk about it. So, Javier, you're going to jump in on this. It sounded like there was a slight miscommunication with what the expectation is here. Yeah, I want to make sure to clear the air. Um, so, to give you a little history of what I encountered, the acceptance test when moving over to platform uh, 04 uh, broke because, you know, in the history, there's been this assumption that the default process type that the life cycle sets is web, right? And that has, wor has worked okay, but at some point that went away. And I think that's kind of where everybody is right now is we want it to go away, this whole notion of a default web process type specifically. In the life cycle specifically. In, yes, in the life cycle. And then we want, and in, in this particular case, to maintain the same UX that we currently have where you build an application it creates an app image and then you just bit, uh, run the app image and it just works. We need to be able to tell the lifecycle what process type to actually set as the default process type, right? So the lifecycle itself not 
doing it automatically, uh, except for it kind of does right now where if there's only one, it sets that to be the default process type. But in our case, we have some tests that have multiple uh, process types. And the bug that we're talking about is if pack tells the lifecycle, hey, if there is a default, or sorry, if there's a process type named web, set that one as the default, it blows up, right? It errors out. So pack itself doesn't actually know what the process types are going to be during the build process at this point in time. So mm -hmm. we're asking that a change be made to the lifecycle so that it just warns and uh, sets the default process type if that process type were to exist. And Did then okay? pack will okay. pack will blindly pass in web and a warning may or may not come out. Correct. And so cool. we'll yeah. keep the existing UX that we had prior. Yep, sounds great. And then in in versions less than oh, 3.0 and less, uh, we the lifecycle is going to continue to default to web. I think that came up as a separate concern or conversation. Natalie, do you that want is... to elaborate on that? Yes. So currently, it's it's the um, if pack were to pass a process type that doesn't exist, the the way the lifecycle is currently is it would blow up for platform API version less than 0 0.4. So if we're going to always pass web, regardless of the platform API version, we should change it for previous APIs. It's okay. So did this blow up in the past then? Yeah, it always did. So the, what I discovered is that um, the exporter would always error if the defined process type did not exist, but uh, pack wasn't passing anything. Ah, okay. Right. So lifecycle had internally determined what a default is. Now we're trying to externalize that yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. So for, for O3, if nothing is passed, it's going to default to web. Um, if something is passed, and it doesn't exist, we can actually relax the restriction for the old API versions and just not set the process type on the image. My understanding is if nothing's passed, the exporter doesn't set anything, but the launcher for previous API is gonna then pick web when nothing's there. Got it, okay, that seems okay too. Yeah. As long as it goes away eventually, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so to get the, so we could like the life cycle doesn't need anything other than, so we could, we could go with the minimal change where the life cycle just warns instead of errors. And that should be sufficient, right? Javier, because you can detect if it's platform less than zero four, you pass nothing. And if it's platform zero four greater, you always specify web and then potentially get a warning. Isn't that sufficient? Yes, I think that's okay. the, the request we've made. Okay. Yeah, it seems like a nice small tactical change there. If there are any more questions about that? I want to chat about the behavior where you set one process type and we automatically set that, or the life cycle automatically selects that regardless of what it is as the default process type. Yeah, so that's a new feature, if I'm not mistaken. And are you opposed to that? Is that what you're thinking? I'm pretty opposed to that. I mean, philosophically, like the life cycle should be very transparent in what it does, right? It's, it, it, should, it should, you know, give it instructions, tell it like faithfully implement this part of the API and it, it you know, does exactly what you ask it to, right? It seems surprising if you created a worker process and you forgot to add your web process and now the worker is suddenly the default, right? It shouldn't, I feel like it shouldn't make that type of decision for you. I think pack, it's fine if pack says web is, you know, always says web, right, or, or whatever, or let's, let's use it, customize it. But I, I don't like that, that behavior at the lifecycle level. So I am curious how you would, from a, you know, the developer's perspective, just running pack and they use whatever build pack and it doesn't have a web uh, process type, it has worker, right? Uh, does that mean that the end user needs to know that they have to set the default process type, even though there's just one to that worker? 
I think the answer to that is yes. Like they're going to see a warning that says we attempted to set web, but there is no web. Therefore, no default process type has been set. Like that's what your warning is going to say. And that's a twig that either you want to go back and actually set the default process type or you don't have to, right? Like you can just pass in, in Dockerisms, you can just pass in Docker run dash dash entry point worker and you can go on with your life. An image doesn't have to have a default process type. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking for, uh, like a better UX in my mind would be that there is no tie to web, right? And ultimately, if pack during the build process is able to determine what the process types are and then do the logic that's currently in the life cycle, we could do it in pack or any other platform for that matter, then you don't have to worry about it. I think it's always going to have to have a default of some kind, like at, at the minimum, like just as an example of a widely used build pack, the, the Java build packs never specify fewer than three uh, process types in any build. And sometimes significantly more than that. Cool. I mean, I'm definitely okay with keeping it as is and then uh, iterating on it once we see more demand for it. Yeah. I like, I, I think Steven's right, right? Like the, the life cycle should have no opinions. Even selecting one if one exists is an opinion, I think. And we, we want to get away from that. Uh, it's one of the really nice things about bringing the web default out of the implementation as well and moving it into the platforms because I expect platforms to have an opinion, right? Um, if there is only one and maybe we need to expose enough information to be only one or to, to determine if there is only one so that uh, coordinators can can tell like or platforms can tell, but like I don't think even selecting the only one is a good opinion for the lifecycle app. I think that operation of like baking a process type into the image, right, is it, it, it's not even clear to me that you want that in all cases, right? Like that should be a very explicit instruction. Hey, you know, create this weird sim link, bake this process type into the image and make the default, not not a, a thing that just happens um, at, yeah. the, at the level of life cycle. You could, you could totally envision a security conscious place not wanting to have a default because accidents happen when there are defaults. That makes sense. Cool. We want to include that change in the patch that we're going to ship. I would be supportive of that, but not about to contribute it right now. Yeah, I, I would argue that maybe not, but. Yeah. Uh, selfishly, I have gotten ahead of what PAC can currently successfully do right now with my build packs. And so whatever mitigates the current problem and gets a pack release out is the thing I'm most concerned about. Following with like a zero nine two a week later, like I'd totally be on board with that. If you think you can get this change in and like not slip the schedule for zero nine one, go for it. But like zero nine one's fixes are the difference between pack and life cycle working together or not. They're not the difference between having an opinion and not having an opinion. Agree, not blocking. Anything else on this? I think that's the last thing on the list. So give everybody some time back unless there's anything else folks would like to chat about. Ernst is trying to speak, but might be muted. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, did you, do we want to talk about project descriptor? Oh yeah, somebody didn't put that on the list. Yeah. I think I forgot to add it. Okay. Who would like to talk about project descriptor? Uh, I guess the, um, from just the feedback in the pull request, so um, I guess there's two suggestions from the RC one about potentially moving stuff under one or two keys. Um, I know you had pushed back against that, Ben. And then the other one was, I think, the file name thing as well. Um, and I'm not married to either of these changes, but um, I do feel like the current project HOML that uh, 
uh, I guess this was Joe's RFC, but I definitely had opinions and helped kind of usher in. Uh, when we went to like our own project management team and other things, had a lot of pushback on being able to use it. Um, and so they definitely only want to use like parts of Project Toml. Um, and kind of, so the kind of context and motivation for this RFC is, is there a way we can get it to be spec compliance and make Project Toml more flexible for uh, other folks who want to use it without kind of it being super locked down, um, if that makes sense. Uh, let me ask one technical question since I can't remember what this said. How How is the mapping between the file name and a top level key achieved? Is it just first one chronologically in the file? Uh, what do you mean by that? So like it's app toml because app is the first Oh, no, I think I would think of it the opposite direction. Like it's the table is app because the file name is app. What happens if I put a foo above the app? Like reading it, is it's, that fine? Is that it, tolerable? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's just based on the file name. It just tells you what key you probably meant to look at. Well, the foo is just a separate key, like app is a key. Um, and app just is special because the file is called app toml. Is there an expectation that uh, that multiple things will use the project toml structure all in the same file? Like, will I expect to see the other things that project toml normally contains, like a build pack listing inside of app.toml? Yes, the things that are defined in Project Toml today would also be defined in the app.toml example. Uh, to your, if you're talking about things that are outside of that, like a Heroku table or something, yeah, um, I don't, I don't know. I think like I, I definitely think our like the product people we've been talking to would like to supplement the specification with their own stuff. Um, in the same but it file. might not right that sometimes it can go under metadata but there's definitely this sense of like yes we want to use this file format but we want it to feel first class like our things yeah. our product to feel first class right and so the top level table name uh being something other than project is 80 percent of that um but the the other keys like that would that we expected to go under metadata, I'm not sure. And maybe that is an area where we can compromise. I'm unsure. I mean, I, I feel like I almost feel like it's maybe even the inverse uh, from when I was talking to Sabri of just like, you don't want like if you're configuring a, I guess, as a concrete example, right, like a Heroku app Events. and you want to have CMB oh, yeah. and it's like, oh, I have to stick all this Heroku configuration <laughs> under metadata. Uh, I think is a thing that rubs our product people the wrong way of like, sure. it should yeah. be top level because this is a Heroku product, right? In a Heroku. Yeah. Google, so I guess the, the question I'm really asked, uh, the, or the thing that I'm sort of dancing around and not driving to particularly well is like what the, this thing about having multiple file names, right? Like not just being project Toml, but there might be like, there could be a Heroku Toml for example, like why wouldn't we, like what is the advantage of having any linkage between the name of the file and a table key, right? Because why can't I have Heroku, a Heroku key and an app key and a project key and a build key and an event key and all of those things just sort of at the top level of Project Toml? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, the in this case, it would result in like, you have a Heroku ID equals, and then you also have a project ID equals. And so like, uh -huh. then there becomes this question of like, well, how do you resolve like those two things if project ID is still maybe not required, but a still a first class thing. Now the, the like, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, 
this is just a proposal. Like the goal is what we're talking about. So yeah, we're like, I just want to make it clear that we're like really open to taking other angles on this. Yeah, I, I've been convinced by Terrence's argument that like, uh, we should allow top level tables, multiple top level tables, rather than my original uh, request that we actually segregate all these things. Like I totally get that um, and how it feels like a second class citizen if you can't do that. But it feels like to me like uh, Tommel allows you just to have a bunch of top level tables, right? Like I'm super skeptical of anything that involves ordering to determine anything useful um, because the very first thing I'm going to do is alphabetize the top mm -hmm. level keys because I'm crazy like that. Uh, so, and then that gets me back to the file, but like, if there was some sort of linkage between a file name and a top level table name, like, why wouldn't I just have a Heroku Toml and a project Toml and an app Toml sitting in the that's, same directory? Yeah. And that's basically what we are doing today. Um, we have a top level, we have a table and, it, and it's not spec compliant. So I think our goal yeah. is like to get, to get ourselves a little bit more in line with yeah. the specification if there's some way. One of the other uh, options that we considered was to make the project Toml, like to decompose it into chunks. Like each table would be its own specification or like its own, have its own little schema. And then you could sort of construct your uh, Heroku.toml or whatever it is out of each of those chunks. And you could even nest them into places that, um, that you know is just a totally different structure than like what we have today. That would probably mean that we need like in pack if we really wanted to be supportive of that. We would we would need like a project build packs uh, um, key, you know, and then it would you'd pass it your project toml and it would just read the project build packs out of it. And then you'd need a project m key and then it would read you know like you'd have to like you couldn't just give it a project toml and call it spec compliant. Because then yeah. all the other other uh, formats wouldn't work. How how committed is the Heroku product team to needing something not called Project Toml? That's called something other than Project Toml. Very. And what does it gain for them to try and like? I assume Heroku specific things wouldn't be standardized as part of Project Toml, right? So like if there's this Heroku Toml sitting off to the right. side, like why isn't that just a Toml file? That yeah, Heroku like you can understands? imagine. Right, right. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, like you can imagine event, like connections to event sources that, you know, hook in some proprietary event types, right? And you want to configure those as part of your project. So. Uh, just more config files, I think, is certainly a, a goal for me. Is to, you know, not okay. Okay, so so there's yeah. so there's this Heroku Toml file over there. Our goal is to minimize the number of config files. So we remove Project Toml. We say that Heroku Toml can contain not only Heroku specific stuff, but all the stuff we would have put into Project Toml as well. How does like Pack know that Heroku Toml even exists? Why doesn't it just look at this this directory and say, oh, there doesn't appear to be a Project Toml. I don't know anything. Yeah, you'd have to pass it to it explicitly with dash p or dash dash. I think it's project. I, don't, I forget it's descriptor the, the or something. descriptor. Yeah, dash dash descriptor. Um, we so it wouldn't recognize it by name. Pack as a library. So we're, we're, we're already looking for. And so functions. through the Heroku CLI, though, effectively, you'd always do that. Yeah, we sort of override the default, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm cool with that. Yeah, I mean, kind of right now, just the solution right now is we're actually like kind of running our own specific, our own schema. And that's kind of where this came from. It's like we made a schema that kind of like encompasses all of project Toml and encompasses the Heroku specific bits. All right. Um, would it, would a, would a different, would an alternative, an acceptable alternative be that there is a Heroku specific table inside of a file and then there is the standard project Toml that's just under a different top level key? Or do you want to encapsulate that whole thing and make the Heroku one a super set of Project Toml schema? Uh, I mean, yeah, the first thing you described is pretty close to what we're doing. Yeah. It's just, yeah, then it's like, well, what is, if you, then you have the whole like project ID, cause we're gonna have, we're gonna have name. We're gonna have like, 
and and we and we want those things to be um, under Heroku or similar. It's, you know, it's not necessarily Heroku, um, but we can do that. Yeah, um, it's just less desirable for us. Yeah, the, I, go ahead. I was just saying the superset I think is attractive to product for the reasons I think not having the superset originally for you, Ben, is attractive to the CMB project is like the ability to extend the format to adapt to different kind of product use cases and things as the platform adds new functionality, um, yeah. I think is attractive to the product team. So if like, the say we added a function. Yeah, if the Heroku one truly is a superset though, like what's the use of, like I, I keep coming back to like, it feels like you've defined another file, right? Another schema, it happens to be the superset of another schema, but like, it is a descriptor, right? It can be passed in if it is truly a superset of the project descriptor, you can just pass it into pack with the same flag you always had. There's a bunch of extra keys that aren't used. I think it, it is a superset sort of right now, only because we're not like very strict on our, um, on how we validate the file. Like, okay. so it happens to work now and we just happen to ignore the keys that we don't understand. Mm. Um, but I think as the spec is written, we're really not supposed to be writing things into uh, the tables we're writing things into. I think it's more formalizing what yeah. currently sort of accidentally works. Because we do right now it is. So the problem is actually the other direction, right? Whether pack will handle your descriptor, not vice versa. Yeah, we don't want pack to suddenly start like clamping down on yeah, okay. a spec and like blowing up because we passed keys it didn't understand. Like that feels like a lot less uh, invasive of a thing. Like, what if, like, how would things look different for you all if we instead had an RFC that said uh, pack should be more tolerant or the, the project Tommel specification is any currently unspecified key should be ignored. We still want pack to pick up. We, do, we don't like the, the root table being called project is against that though, right? Like we want, we would have to tell pack that that table is called Heroku or whatever. Um, yeah, and I think this becomes more important as we start to add like behaviors that are defined by the things in project, like uh, if we use ID for image name and um, trying to think of some other things, you know, if it gets put on the metadata of the image. Of the mixing stuff you're talking about, potentially too, right? For stack Right, max. that kind of stuff, yeah. I think that's gonna be a separate table, but I'm not sure. But if pack doesn't understand it, or if the life cycle doesn't understand it, it can just be ignored, right? All, like the Heroku specific stuff? Right, but they don't no, want Heroku specific stuff with the name of like project, like project ID and Heroku ID. They want that to be a single key that a customer defines under a single. Yeah, Heroku like it, it, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put a pin in like, assume just for a moment that you all were taller, you all were accepting that the top level table needed to be called project. Like we'll, we'll discuss, I think that's orthogonal what that is. But if that were true, if the top level key was always project, including in the Heroku specific extension case, you could add your extensions, we'd ignore them and pack and no one would be the wiser, right? Like nothing would, would break there, which then puts uh, with the, with the tweak to say that all unknown, all unspecified keys are ignored. Then yeah, sort of that, orthogonal to that is the name of the table is more problematic. Yeah, I think that's definitely like one of the two suggestions in here is definitely like the things that are unspecified by the spec are basically unspecified. And because I think the way it's defined now in the spec, anything that is unspecified is technically incorrect, right? I think that's how we've defined it. Yeah, I, ass I assume it was written in my speak, yeah. which was it is reserved for our future usage. Yep. Yeah. And so the, like definitely one of the two pillars of this RFC, and I'm happy to split them into separate ones, uh, is about making that more flexible. Do you expect to see support for multiple top level tables? Like a Heroku table and potentially like a, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, like a VMware table. Yeah. Like that's it. Uh, like I'm 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 a lot more comfortable with tying the top level table name to the file name if we only expect a single top level table ever. Right? 
my big concern is when we change the name of if, if when we change the name of that top level thing, but there's two of them in there, and then like ordering and name of file, especially yeah, since somebody might have like dash blue or dash green in their file names or something like that. Like that's where things get a little jumpy for me. I, I think we're expecting potentially to have more than one top level table but not fulfilling the same need like you wouldn't see a heroku or in a vmware table potentially in the same file but we could have another top level table like how build is a, a top level table that's like we want this to be not kind of subsection under heroku dot it's like we want events to be yeah. its own table or something right yeah so I am firmly in the camp of no matter what, let's go ahead and relax the restriction about unknown keys and the spec and say, we will just ignore them, which I think gives a lot of people a lot of flexibility to do what they want there. Um, but rather than continue going on here, I think I'd like to see some more iteration on how to sort of reconcile that top level ta table naming. I get yeah. I get Heroku's desire for it to be Heroku, right? Makes total sense to me. So um, I think just picking, identifying some of the edge cases around what happens when you have multiple ones in different orders and stuff. Makes okay, sense. cool. I still like the decomposing idea, like passing like build packs as a piece of Tomble or something to pack and stuff like that. Uh, I can write it so up many in the files. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that many files. That'll be up to us to pipe. As I, as I constantly tell people, like uh, our customers in CF lost their shit when we asked them to write three lines of YAML in a descriptor. And like every time I see someone show me 500 lines of YAML for Kubernetes, I'm like, nope, not going to happen. And I think the same thing is true, Jesse. Like if you start asking people to write multiple TOML files, people like are barely aware Tommel exists in the first place. Now you're asking me for three of those? Uh, -uh no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I don't want to make them do three. Yeah, yeah. yeah we have app.json. Man, that is just yeah. a, that's, a nightmare. To that's support. why I like the composability of, like, you know, if you translated app.json over to a Tommel file, like, you would have, like, a staging environment. To your point, like, the blue-green would be in that same file, and then yeah. you would need to tell pack about those different, uh, they may have different build packs for blue versus green. and being able to yeah, extract so. that out and tell pack just to, just about the build packs without having to understand like a the JSON path completely. kind of syntax. Yeah, exactly. Like a Tomo path yeah. syntax. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'm sure many of us have meetings to go to. Thanks everybody. Yeah, see you.